Hey everyone! In this video, we'll begin our exploration of sexual reproduction in plants. Why do we care about plants? Well, for one thing, they make up most of our food supply. And if you have a mind for business, agriculture makes up about 6% of the entire world economy. Also, plants are cool. Flowering plants are especially cool. They basically dominated our planet before humans came along, and it's kind of fun to see how they became so successful, and it has a lot to do with how they reproduce. Sexual reproduction in flowering plants can be hard to understand, but we'll ease our way into it. As usual, We'll start with what you've already learned and expand from there. In this video, we have three questions, and they are How are male and female gametophytes produced? Where are they produced? And how does sexual reproduction differ in plants and humans? To understand sex in plants, Let's start by reviewing how the life cycle of plants differs from that of humans and fungi. Humans are diploid, pretty much throughout our entire life cycle. The only haploid cells we make, through meiosis, are the gametes, sperm and egg, which complete sexual reproduction during fertilization. The only form that humans take is that of a multicellular diploid. Fungi are kind of the opposite. Most of their life cycle is spent as a haploid organism, which can reproduce asexually or sexually. If it reproduces sexually, the diploid cells only divide by meiosis, making the organism haploid again right away. Plants are sort of in between humans and fungi. Sometimes the plant is a diploid plant, called the sporophyte, while at other times the plant is a haploid plant, or gametophyte. The sporophyte produces haploid spores through meiosis. These haploid spores then undergo mitosis to produce more haploid cells and, in this way, grow into the haploid multicellular gametophyte. The gametophyte, as its name suggests, is what produces the gametes, the egg or the sperm. Once these complete fertilization, they once again produce the diploid sporophyte plant. This changing from diploid sporophyte to haploid gametophyte and back is known as alternation of generations. One generation of the organism is spent as a sporophyte, and the offspring of this organism is the haploid gametophyte. The offspring of the gametophyte is the diploid sporophyte. So each generation of plant alternates between haploid and diploid. Note that both haploid and diploid forms of the plant are multicellular. In some plants, like this fern, the multicellular gametophyte is visible to the naked eye. But in flowering plants, as we'll see in a bit, the gametophytes are made of only a few cells, which, for most of their development, exist within the larger sporophyte. They have what we call reduced gametophytes, because the gametophytes are smaller compared with other non-flowering plants. At this point, try to answer the question, do humans have alternating generations? 
Why or why not? I'll give you a few seconds to pause the video. Okay, so humans do not have alternation of generations because their haploid cells are single-celled. Alternation of generations involves a multicellular haploid stage and a multicellular diploid stage. So, to sum up, humans are diploid, except for gametes. Fungi are basically haploid except for the zygotes. And plants spend some of their time as a multicellular haploid, the gametophytes, and some as a multicellular diploid, the sporophyte. Here, we'll only concern ourselves with flowering plants, since they're the dominant type of plant on Earth and because they include most of the crops and species that humans grow. Let's start with something you're already familiar with, sexual reproduction in humans, and compare it to sexual reproduction in flowering plants. Recall that when human diploid cells go through meiosis, the products of that meiosis are the gametes, the sperm, and the egg. But in flowering plants, when diploid cells of the sporophyte undergo meiosis, they don't produce haploid gametes. Instead, meiosis produces haploid cells called spores, which can be male or female. These single-celled haploid spores produce more haploid cells through mitosis. The resulting group of haploid cells make up the multicellular haploid gametophyte. The male gametophyte is inside the pollen grain, while the female gametophyte is inside a structure called the ovule. Humans do not produce gametophytes, which again is because gametophytes are both multicellular and haploid. The only haploid cells humans produce are single-celled gametes, the sperm and egg. In plants, the pollen contains the sperm, which, like in humans, is the male gamete. The ovule contains the egg which, like in humans, is the female gamete. Here is a picture of a bee on a flower. You can see the pollen rubbing off on it. And you can see how tiny the individual pollen grains are. Here is a picture of a smaller flower that's been cut open and you can see the ovules here. The ovules are much bigger than the sperm and can be seen with the naked eye. Note that the pollen and ovules themselves are not the gametes of plants. They're the structures that hold the cells that make up the male and female gametophytes, including the sperm and egg. When the sperm from the pollen reaches the ovules, fertilization occurs, followed by the ovule developing into a seed. The seed then germinates and the embryo within divides by mitosis, eventually producing the sporophyte or plant. All of this, up until the seed falls from the plant, happens within the flower. Why does all this happen within the flower? Probably because it's advantageous to shelter the gametes and provide a safe place for fertilization and seed development to occur. Humans do this too, but in a very different way, through sexual intercourse. The male delivers his sperm right into the vagina. From there, the sperm only have a short swim to reach the egg. 
where fertilization and development can occur within the safety of the female. We'll get to more differences and similarities between humans and plants later. Next, let's add more detail to our picture of plant reproduction. In order to see where production of the male and female gametophytes happen, let's go over some basic flower anatomy. Here's a sketch of a flower. Going from the outside inwards, we have the sepals, the petals, the stamens, and here's one stamen, and in the middle of the flower, the carpal. The stalk of a stamen is called the filament. And this is the anther. We'll label a few parts of the carpal as well. This top part is the stigma. And inside of the carpal, we have the ovary. Within the ovary are ovules. Here is one ovule. Development of the pollen with its gametophyte occurs in the anther, while development of the female gametophyte occurs within the ovule. Remember, each stamen has one anther and one filament. Parts of the carpal include the stigma and the ovary, which houses the ovules. Let's now examine, at a basic level, the production of the male gametophyte, which again occurs within the anther. Anthers contain diploid cells called microsporocytes. The suffix site means cell. Micro means small. So the microsporocyte is a small cell that produces spores. Microsporocytes are small because the pollen grains they eventually become are small. The microsporocyte undergoes meiosis to produce four haploid cells called spores. Since they too are small, they're called microspores. The meiosis that produces the microspores is also known as microsporogenesis. Genesis meaning the production of. So this meiosis causes the genesis or production of the microspores. Each of the four haploid microspores then undergoes mitosis to produce more haploid cells. This happens within what develops into a pollen grain. This group of cells within the pollen grain constitutes the male gametophyte, or microgametophyte. Two of those cells are sperm cells. This mitosis is also known as microgametogenesis because each spore produces one microgametophyte by dividing through mitosis. So to summarize, each microsporocyte undergoes meiosis or microsporogenesis, producing four haploid microspores each of which undergo mitosis, or microgametogenesis, to produce four gametophytes, each within its own pollen grain. Production of the female gametophyte occurs, as we said, in the ovules. While each anther contains many, many microsporocytes, each ovule generally contains only one diploid megasporocyte. Mega means large. The megasporocyte undergoes meiosis, 
producing four haploid spores, three of which die off, leaving only one surviving haploid megaspore. The megaspore then divides a few times by mitosis, forming a group of cells within the megaspore. These cells make up the female gametophyte. One of them is the egg. At this point, you may have noticed that we didn't give special names to the meiosis and mitosis in this diagram on the right. That's because I'd like you to guess what they are. So try to answer the question, what would you call this meiosis and this mitosis? I'll give you a few seconds to pause the video. Okay, so well done if you attempted the question. This meiosis is also called megasporogenesis because it's the genesis or production of the megaspore. This mitosis is called mega gameto genesis because it results in the production of the mega gameto fight. So to sum up, each ovule has one megasporocyte, which undergoes meiosis, to produce four spores, one of which survives, which undergoes mitosis, to produce the haploid female megagametophyte, which is still within the ovule. Once the pollen grain from the anther moves through the carpal and reaches the ovule, fertilization and in flowering plants, it's a double fertilization, occurs, followed quickly by development of the ovule into a seed. The embryo in the seed divides by mitosis to become a seedling, and lots and lots of mitosis later, you have yourself a large, multicellular, diploid sporophyte. In the next video, we'll add even more detail to how the male gametophyte and the female gametophyte are produced. And in the video after that, we'll examine double fertilization and seed development. But we're not finished here yet. Now that we have a better picture of plant reproduction, let's complete our comparison of sexual reproduction in humans and flowering plants. Let's start with the differences. In humans, as we said, there are no gametophytes, just single-celled gametes, whereas flowering plants have gametophytes, with the male gametophyte formed in the anther and the female gametophyte formed within the ovule. In humans, mitosis, followed by meiosis, produces the gametes. So in humans, meiosis comes last. But in flowering plants, meiosis produces spores, which then divide by mitosis to become gametophytes. So in plants, mitosis comes last. Another difference may be obvious, but it's important. In humans, you need a female and a male to reproduce but most flowering plants are hermaphroditic. In other words, the same individual can create both male and female gametophytes and gametes. This is why plants can self-fertilize and humans can't. Lastly, humans carry out fertilization, but plants carry out double fertilization. I'll get to double fertilization in a later video, but I just wanted to list it here because it is a major difference. Humans and flowering plants also have some surprising similarities. First, during meiosis on the female side, 
both produce only one surviving cell. And on the male side, meiosis in both produces four haploid cells. Second, both use mitosis and meiosis to produce gametes, albeit in a different order. Third, in both, the male gamete or gametophyte is small, sperm in humans, and the micro gametophyte within pollen grains in plants. And in both, the female gamete or gametophyte is relatively large. The egg cell in humans and the mega gametophyte in plants. Why are male gametes and gametophytes small? This is perhaps because the male gametes are the ones doing the traveling. In humans, the sperm has to swim to the egg. And the sperm cells within the pollen grain have to make it to the ovule in flowering plants. So, Humans and flowering plants ultimately have to accomplish the same thing. Produce the sperm and the egg, and get the sperm to the egg. But as you've seen, they go about it in very different ways. Okay, so that's it for this video. With some practice, you should be able to explain how male and female gametophytes are produced, where they're produced, and how sexual reproduction differs in humans and flowering plants. As always, feel free to watch part or all of the video again and make sure you complete the learning guide. In the next video, we'll examine the production of male and female gametophytes in detail with some fun pictures from one of my past research projects. See you all then.